very much the organizers and the people who came, many from far away, and uh, put up with our Midwestern uh, storms and all this good stuff. Um, so, so yeah, this is kind of um, uh, a departure from, I mean, I think most of the stuff that of, of my history that people know about. Ironically, it is a topic that, um, I, as a graduate student and getting to know Carl Woese and his work and his thoughts on translation and the importance of developing the relationship between genotype and phenotype, um, as absolutely critical to making a modern cell. Um, and so I was really interested in the components and the machineries of translation, their evolution and all of that. And one of the things that was sort of you know, coming out was an understanding of uh, that codon usage is non-random. Um, so that, uh, you know, to put phenylalanine in a protein, you can use either UUU or UUC, and it's not random. It differs between lineages, and I was always very curious why and stuff like that. But for something like 30 years, um, almost, yeah, 25 years. Um, it was just something that's like, someday I want to go back and look at that again. Um, I actually ended up going back and looking at this for pretty wildly different reasons. Um, essentially, everything I'm going to talk about is work uh, uh, by and with uh, Jim Davis and Katie Carberg, both of whom are here. Um, so I'll just simply refer all questions to them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I want to talk a little about um, the development of our thought on uh, codon usages within genomes, and uh, then talk about some observations. They originally came from E. coli. Um, I'm going to illustrate them in Salmonella, uh, and then go back and um, so this is going to be out of historical order, and go back and talk about some discoveries we had comparing E. coli and Salmonella. Um, and going back and looking at the, the unanswered questions, the things that really didn't fit or make sense, and um, what our current thoughts on those are. And actually, I probably will mention, it's, at least at some level, open questions. Um, so this current foray into codon usage started um, as a result of having this uh, figure from this paper shown at a meeting. Um, I didn't see the paper when it came out, but Paul Sharp showed this figure at a meeting, a uh, very early genome meeting. And what this is, this is plotting the E. coli genes by their codon usage. Okay, so you, you've got the frequency of UUU, UUC, you know, UA, UG, and so on. And um, this is just a point in a highly dimensional space. Um, we tend to do it in a 59-dimensional space. There's actually only 42 degrees of freedom, but, um, and the problem is, so I can take a gene, I can calculate its coordinates. What's the frequency of each codon used? Plot it on my 59-dimensional graph paper, and then I find it's hard to publish and it's hard to look at and stuff, because not many people, you know, it's hard to pass around 59-dimensional graphs. Um, so uh, people uh, reduce the dimensionality, principal component analysis. I'm going to be showing figures done in, in factorial correspondence analysis. This is a shadow of the data in which the data have been rotated to make the biggest shadow you can get. That is to emphasize the variation within the data. Okay, so, so, yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, so, so, so generally, there's a first component, which is the most variation, and a second component, which is the next. And we could rotate these and show you more dimensions. Um, but this is what they observed, okay? So they found um, each plot point is a gene, and they have been plotted to separate them by codon usage. And they got a figure that they described as a rabbit head. So we have a head, and if you look at what genes have this sort of common codon usage, you find typically coli genes. 
if you go up here and say, so here's an ear of the rabbit, and you say, what are these genes? And you find ribosomal proteins, amino acyl tRNA synthetase, RNA polymerase, translation and elongation factors. Um, the, uh, and in short, it's a list mostly of the abundant proteins of the cell, genes for the abundant proteins. It's highly expressed genes. This had been known since 1981, roughly, um, that organisms uh, use a specific codon usage optimized we, you know, uh, to uh, make abundant proteins. Well, what was new in this paper was coming over here and saying, well, what are these genes? They're different. They're odd. And what they found was these tended to be mobile elements. Uh, transposase, integrase, prophage, transposons, restriction modification enzymes. Um, in short, it was sort of a who's who of mo who's moving around. Now, um, so um, I, I, I want to take a short digression. Um, Penny showed last night um, you know, the concept of the pan genome. If we look at a genome of different members of the species, okay, so she was showing us uh, different prochlorococcus genomes and the fact that they only have a limited number of genes in common and then a bunch of other genes that are found only in some strains. Um, so E. coli 0157H7, this was the first case where just how immense this was was pointed out by uh, Nicole Perna and, and, and colleagues. Um, e. coli 0157H7 has 1,600 genes that are not present in E. coli K12. K12 has 600, not in 0157H7. So it's a difference of 2,200 genes out of sort of 4,500, 5,000. Um, this is a profound difference, uh, organism to organism, and nobody would question whether they should be the same species. Um, they, uh, I mean, they, they, phenotypically, they're quite similar. Yes, there are you know, uh, issues in terms of pathogenesis and so forth. Um, most of the genes, again, as pointed out, mostly we actually don't know what these gene differences do. Um, but it is, you know, the only way you can construct this is uh, there's got to be a lot of gains and losses. Um, so, so we were seeing genes are being gained and lost, um, and this kind of fits with these are genes that we know are mobile. Um, and uh, so um, where did these genes come from? What's distinguishing? the strains of the species. Um, I mean, we're, we're searching, they're acquiring DNA, but it, DNA doesn't come from nowhere. Um, and I would like to argue it doesn't even come from a virus. Viruses come from cells, so viral DNA comes from cells. Um, viruses move it around, but. Um, so, uh, I mean, the thinking at the time was, where do they come from? They come from some other source. And when we look at them and we see they have a different codon usage, a different base composition, we assume they come from far away. And after they're acquired, actually the most common fate is they're lost again. But if they remain, the belief is they will drift to look like the, the uh, host genome. And this real, I mean, this makes sense. And in fact, there's a lot of data supporting us. Um, this, if you put a gene in E. coli and wait for a while, it looks like E. coli. Now, a while is millions of years, but um, nature is patient. Evolution is patient. Um, okay, so our question was, if they don't look like E. coli genes, but they look like their donor, who do they look like? Who is the donor? Simple question. Um, so basically what we need is a database of all of the codon usages out there in nature, and then we can go back to these alien genes in E. coli and ask, who do they look like? Where do they come from? Um, this was uh, an, a very, um, from, from the 
original formulating of the question to actually having running software kind of was slow at first, but you know, so five to 10 years. Um, I want to illustrate where we ended up, where we are today. Um, and I'm actually cutting over to Salmonella um, LT2, um, Salmonella enterica, uh, uh, simply because some of the data I'm going to show later uh, are in this genome. And this looks like the rabbit head. This is all the genes. Um, Medig et al. did not have the complete E. coli genome. Okay, um, so we have the rabbit head. I've flipped all of these figures, unfortunately, relative to the original paper. These are the abundant proteins, and these are weird genes, um, alien genes, whatever we want to call them. Um, how do we know that? Well, um, showing in orange is 2,040 genes in this genome that are not only present in this genome, they are present in four other diverse E. coli. Well, I'm sorry, this is Salmonella. They are present in four other diverse Salmonellas and five diverse E. coli. So this is, again, going back to the concept of a core genome. We are going here beyond the species E. coli. Nobody doubts Salmonella and E. coli are different species. Um, so we're seeing, here's the core genes. So typical genes, abundant proteins. Um, how do we teach a computer to analyze this? Um, well, what we want to do is have a computer look at this, except it doesn't look at the drawing, it looks at the real data, and pick the most common code on usage. It's like the mode of a distribution, except we're doing this in 59 dimensions. Um, so, um, you know, sort of clarifying that in our own minds and, and, and doing it took a little while. Um, but that is the modal code on usage of the uh, core genes of Salmonella. We can go look at proteins that we believe are abundant and look at their code on usages. That's the modal code on usage of our set of abundant proteins. We can look at those together and go, you know, really, just talking about two classes of genes, you've got a continuum here. Unfortunately, it's a continu continuum in 59 dimensions, um, but after much um, being worried that the mathematics was going to be overwhelming, the mathematics was not overwhelming, and we could do it. We could construct a line through these two points and say, this looks like E. coli. Anything that looks like this codon usage looks like native E. coli genes. Okay. Um, the, but so one of the, our, our interest here was the odd genes. And we can apply the same comparative genomic principles. The cyan genes over here are, 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 are genes for proteins that are, that are only in Salmonella LE2, L, L, LT2. They're not in other salmonellas. They're not in other E. coli's. Um, these are recently acquired genes. This is the simplest explanation. So these are the genes we want to find out where did they come from. So we need their code on usage. Well, we can, we've identified them. We can find their modal code on usage. We can construct an axis, you know, kind of like alienness. So if you're close. If you're out here, you look alien. You don't look anything like these genes. And we can actually say, where do you project on the axis? How alien do you look? OK. So this is our, our point. Now we're going to segue back in time. Um, so uh, we wanted to find out where do the alien genes come from. Uh, from E. coli or Salmonella, we can ask, um, what are the alien genes? Um, ultimately, we, we indeed went to this most recently acquired genes. They're in one strain, not other strains. We could build a database of the native codon usages that, of all of the genomes we could lay our hands on. And then we could say, OK, who looks like a donor of the genes that are alien to E. coli? And. Um, the answer was no one. Um, that was a little depressing. It's only 10 years of work. Um, 
the, so five years of intense work. Um, the, uh, but we failed to find a donor. And, and you know, we still don't have a donor in the sense we were originally looking for it. Um, instead, the students came to the rescue and they said, actually these alien genes look like something else. We were looking at E. coli and they said, well, this looks like alien genes in salmonella. Gary goes, yes, of course, E. coli and salmonella are closely related. So, of course the genes look similar. I go, no, no. The alien genes of these two species are more similar than are their vertically inherited genes. Um, okay, so um, that, uh, we did a lot of work trying to figure out what we could be doing wrong, and of course in doing it, we came up with cleaner methods of doing the analysis, and the signal only got stronger. So yellow is the core genes of salmonella, red is the core genes of E. coli. You can clearly see they have different codon usages. The alien genes are over here, and you cannot see the difference. And in fact, most of the distance between those two points is due to statistical sampling error. Because in fact, no two genes in those two data sets are the same gene. That's how we found them. We found them as genes that are not present anywhere else. Um, and it's not just the projection. They really are different. These, these points are three times closer than those. Um, so where do the alien genes come from? I'm going to um, sort of jump ahead slightly here. Um, well, wherever it is, it seems to be the same place for the two of them. Um, oh, by the way, so I have to put a tree in. It's me. Okay, so, but this is similarity of codon usage. E. coli genome core genes, you completely, there's absolutely no ambiguity as a set. Any individual E. coli is clearly different than any individual salmonella. Um, if you look at their recently acquired genes, they are totally intermixed. There's no, it, it's, it's, and so, I mean, we spend an insane amount of time going over, can you get everybody, because, well, you just drift to the same thing. Well, when their core genes are drifting apart, why are their alien genes drifting together? And why are they drifting together so close? Um, that's really a fantastically improbable event. Uh, maybe they're selected to be similar. Well, based on what? Um, and again, it's got to be, I mean, the, the, um, the high expression genes are not, I mean, they're under intense selection, but they don't become more similar. Um, it's an unpublished work of, of Jim Davis. Um, what we come down to is, do they come from a common source? Um, the gotcha is, you know, what, what a cop out. Of course, that ex if they come from the same place, they look the same. Okay, so, yeah, but the point is, I mean, we have tried very hard to find alternative explanations, and we can't. Um, the, uh, nothing else, I mean, you can speculate all you want, but we wanted something that actually fit the data. Um, okay, so with them, but that leaves us with, um, if they're coming from the same source, and we can't find the source or anywhere else, that kind of makes them their own source, and that's kind of where we ended up left. Um, so if they're coming from themselves, why are they different? The whole point was they came in different, and then they drift to look like the host. If they're coming from the host and they're different, why are they different? Um, and one of the things, I don't think I've, you know, um, so, so, so just, you know, looking at some fun stuff. So in trying to understand this, um, this is mostly I'm segueing into, into uh, uh, work from Katie, um, we looked at the genes and the genome in more detail. Which are the ones that have this funny usage? And what we're going to do is we're going to take any individual gene, we're going to project it on this axis, this sort of expression level axis, so we get kind of an expressivity measure 
If you're far from the axis, you don't look like this at all, and we're going to put you on a really dark background. But if you look like it, we're going to grade your color from green to red as, as you move out on this axis. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to project onto this axis and see how alien you look. Now, if you're out here, you're a long way from any point on that axis. And again, we're just going to darken your background. So here's an, a chunk of uh, Salmonella chromosome. And so what we have here is um, projection position on the expression axis, projection position on the alienness axis. Backgrounds are colored by axis position. The luminosity is how well you match the axis. So, so a lot of these genes, I mean, they look like they're just kind of near the origin. They match both axes reasonably well. We have a Fitz Z gene over here. This looks like a high expression protein. It's moving out into the red. It is an absolutely crummy match to the alien gene axis. Um, OK, fine. So um, here's like a, yeah, well, actually, uh, uh, some abundant protein uh, gene clusters. Um, and so you, again, you see these have very red colors because their projection point is way out in the high expression area. And a lot of these are absolutely crummy matches to the alien gene axis because they're just so far away from the origin. Um, OK. Here's anciently acquired DNA, cobalamin biosynthesis. This is characteristic of salmonella. All of them do it. This came in early in the, you know, we believe it's one of the early differentiating events of salmonella lineage and E. coli lineage. So it's been there tens of millions of years. And as expected, these genes, no matter where they came from originally, now look like E. coli. Okay, they're all mostly sort of these greens, and, and some of these look, you know, picking on a little red uh, uh, tinge as, as, as an, uh, a more abundant protein would be expected. Propane dial uh, utilization, same story. All the salmonellas do it. Um, and except for this areas up around the regulatory uh, gene, they look like everyday garden variety salmonella genes. Now it gets a little more interesting. Um, here's a pathogenicity island. These were acquired, this is pathogenicity island one. This came in at about the same time as propane dial utilization and, um, and, and, and cobalamin biosynthesis, but it's codon usage looks completely different. These look almost totally uniformly like alien genes, like they came in yesterday, okay? These match the codon usage of the things that E. coli and salmonella have acquired most recently, but by comparative genome analysis, we know this was not recently acquired. It was acquired a very long time ago. And we have tried all we can to rationalize it. Well, maybe it's cryptically coming and going. And all. So, no, it's just been there a long time. Why doesn't it look like E. coli? But this kind of comes back to the same question. Well, I was, OK, so we have pathogenicity island one, some more. Pathogenicity island two looks the same. Um, right next to pathogenicity island two, we have uh, tetrathionate respiration, and it looks just like salmonella. Um, so again, it's not like where you are physically in the genome. This is right there, and in fact, a lot of people uh, consider this part of pathogenicity island two. Prophage, okay, here's Fell's prophage. Looks like it was acquired yesterday. Another class of genes, though, that we routinely see as looking, having this codon usage is uh, extracellular polysaccharide, surface glycosylation. Um, almost every place we have seen uh, you know, genes of this type, they look alien to the genome we find them in. Now, we actually do know that these are clearly being exchanged amongst bacteria. So um, these are not you know, necessarily ancient in these genomes. OK. So recently acquired genes tend to have a peculiar codon usage. That's where we started. We thought it was the donor. 
it is the donor. The problem is the donor is the species itself. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so, so then why is it peculiar if it's coming from within the species? Um, the, uh, uh, okay, most anciently acquired genes look like their host. Again, this goes back to if you acquire DNA and it hangs out in, in, in your genome, it starts to look like you. It dr drifts to look like you. It doesn't require any special anything. It's inevitable unless something keeps you different, okay? So some anciently acquired genes don't look like the host. They have this peculiar codon usage. Um, and so it is not depending upon a, a distant donor and it is not depending upon recent acquisition. So again, what's keeping it different? Why is it odd? Um, now, high expression codon usage, we would argue we understand. It's selected to be very accurately and efficiently translated, okay? There's a selective pressure to have that maintains this codon usage in this gene set. These look just like that, only whatever that selection, if it is something like that, that selection is different. What is it? Um, and I mean, a lot of these genes, um, so, so now we really want an answer that fits all of the data, okay? So, you know, things like the pathogenicity island, well, you know, salmonella is not really a happy camper when it's expressing these genes. It is making a profound transition. It's, uh, you know, uh, spy one is cellular invasion, spy two is life inside a macrophage. <laughs> That's a pleasant experience. Um, yeah, uh, these, this, these variable genes of the pan genome, they are not pseudogenes, they're occasionally useful, but they're clearly not often useful because they're in very few of the genomes of the species. So we're leaning towards, you know, these may be things that save you, like maybe when you're starving or under some other unusual or stressful condition, but it doesn't, it's a condition that doesn't happen often enough to put them in all the genomes of the species. Um, so, so, okay, this, you know, we, ha we had these vague ideas floating around. Katie turned up a very interesting data set. Um, so this is Salmonella LT2 genome, and the highlighted genes um, are genes that respond to stringent response, okay? So we learned about stringent response, at least I did decades ago. That's what a cell does when it's starving and it shuts down much of its macromolecular biosynthesis machinery, okay? So it's, we talk about what's turned off under stringent response. And the genes that are most turned off, tenfold or more, are in blue. We don't talk typically about what genes expression goes up under stringent response. The genes that most go up most, tenfold or more are in this sort of pinkish color. They look like our funny alien genes, stress response genes. It, stress response is not the right term um, because these genes are not uniformly turned up under stress. But it is a codon usage that is useful at the time the gene is needed, okay? Um, it is a codon usage useful for these genes. Um, uh, the, uh, so this is actually what's turned up under um, early stationary phase. She's now found it for now, a year ago, found a, uh, <coughs> uh, a data set on late, late stationary phase. Um, and uh, so, Again, we don't really know why the codon usage is useful. Um, we do believe there is this, cor this correlation. 
It really does sound like stressful positions, uh, conditions. It could be starvation. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, what we really want to know is when are genes of this codon usage expressed? Um, and and what are the phys what's the physiological state? Turns out, there, starvation, there are no data sets. The data I showed you was not starvation. It was a genetic imitation of starvation. Almost all of the data out there, and people go, oh, oh we have stationary phase. That's starvation. No, stationary phase is stationary phase. It is not necessarily starvation or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay, so, um, you know, it, it's important to remember one of the discoveries early on in this project was um, <clears throat> the exchanged genes, okay, that was a, not codon usage based, that was comparative genomics based. The exchanged genes are exchanged often enough to make them indistinguishable between E. coli and salmonella, okay? Whereas their core genomes have drifted apart in the 100 million years. Their exchanged genes are indistinguishable. So, so now how much exchange does that take? Oh well, maybe a successful event every 200,000 years. That'll do it. That'll give us kind of what we observe. You know, people think, oh, if it's exchanged often enough, to do something, it's got to be like, you know, once a day or once a year or something. No. It, genomes are really stable, um, you know, and we're looking at, at drift. Um, okay. <clears throat> the, uh, and, um, the, the, this, this effect, this alien ear on genomes, I mean, this, we ever, essentially everywhere we look, we see it. Um, the, a apropos of Penny's talk, one of the great ironies is, it, early in his work on this, Jim Davis went through and looked at which genomes seem to have the most and the least alien DNA. Okay, we just maybe not should call it alien now, but, and one of his least alien DNA genomes, top 10 for least, was Prochlor Prochlorococcus marinus. One of his, perfect, um, one of his most alien DNA genomes, top 10, Prochlorococcus marinus. <laughs> Different strains. One was high light, one was low light. Um, but, so, so this is, you know, organisms are, um, are not homogeneous in terms of these things. They have lifestyles. Um, but even in a lot of genomes where we, for example, see um, little to no high expression codon usage, okay? I mean, the codon usages of the most abundant and least abundant proteins in the genome are on an individual gene completely indistinguishable. Um, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> with good statistics, looking at a lot of genes, we can see that they're very slightly different. There's a little push. But it's a tiny push. Even in some of these genomes, we see this alien gene set. So one of the things about that is it means it's not just anti-high expression, okay? Um, if you've got no high expression bias, it's really hard to get anti-high expression bias. Um, I mean, the number of, of rationalizations people have handed us, you know, and it's, it's good. They're trying to find explanations, but in fact, very few fit the data. So I want to thank you. And, uh, you know, we don't understand. There's limited um, literature on comparing um, starvation codon usage and non starvation codon usage. All of the A computational work on it is characters, it is a single amino acid starvation. Um, so the cells are not going to be starving for energy or really anything else. They've just genetically knocked out the ability to make the amino acid. Like, this is not what this evolved for, folks. Um, how to survive a knockout mutant. Um, the, uh, um, uh, there's theoretical work. Um, 
there is, I think there is something in this. Um, there's some work on what are the tRNA pools under starvation, except it's not really starvation. Um, it's just slow growth rate. And it's not really slow growth rate. I mean, if we want to really see a cell that's growing slowly, I mean, you know, a two, two hour generation time is not slow growth rate. Um, the, uh, and, and, and even for E. coli, I mean, E. coli, nature probably, yeah, E. coli probably doubles once a day. And, and we have these oceanic organisms. You know, once a day is common theme. You go subsurface. Now we're talking about, people, you know, numbers suggesting less than once a year. Um, but so we have no, there's basically no experimental data out there for us to go on. Questions? Okay, so so um, it, yeah, so so Harry is just asked, could it be, for example, a change in the tRNA pool itself? For example, loss of um, uh, the the modifications uh, of the anti-codon loop that uh, dis which uh, enhance the discrimination amongst alternative codons. Um, you know, that is actually the first suggestion I have heard that fits some of the data that nobody ever talks about. Because one of the dirty little secrets is there is a shift in E. coli has one tRNA for the amino acid. Okay, so it's decoding both codons. So it is always charged to the same level because it's just one tRNA. And yet, the ratio in usage of those alternative codons can shift. Now we can rationalize that in high expression because one is more accurate or efficient or faster or whatever. Yeah. Um, that is a very cool suggestion for what might be going on in some of these others. Yes? Does your rabbit really has two ears, or if you include the third component, it will grow a third ear? Have you looked at the principal components beyond the top? Oh, absolutely. You want to see some? I, I, I probably have them on my laptop. Um, <laughs> the, uh, they look beautiful. You know, actually, I mean, first, for, for E. coli, the first two are, are really the coolest. Um, maybe we'll, ooh, let's see. Uh, so there's an, a beautiful example. Yeah, notably, the rabbits rotated further. Um, one of the things, actually, I really do want to point out here. Um, if you look at this, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, I mean, we can look at almost anything. By the way, the first component, the greatest variation in codon usage is not the expression-related codon usage. It is this alien, this weird codon usage. It is the largest component in many genomes, even ones where the, what everybody talks about is the expression-related. Um, but no, they don't develop a third year. Um, the, uh, you do get some funny shapes and sizes and stuff, um, but they don't. And the alien branch still looks similar even if you go to Bacillus very, very far away. Yeah, that, that was, there was Bacillus subtilis. Yeah. It looks to me like it's a high expression here. So, so the, here, color coding, red is the corresponding E. coli gene looks abundant. <laughs> um, and, and they grade down yeah, through cooler and cooler colors until you, you know, get down in here. So this projection of if I think it's high expression in E. coli, it's probably high expression elsewhere, works amazingly well. That's what allowed us to automate this. And what's beautiful about this particular thing is we got around all the discussion of annotation. So we're not doing it based upon it's called a ribosomal protein, which to a computer scientist means 
Yeah, ribosomal protein methyl transferase. It's called a ribosomal protein, right? Um, they, um, we completely bypass all of that because we're just directly saying, what's the corresponding gene in E. coli to that gene in Bacillus subtilis? It's hugely simplified things. Um, I don't know why nobody realized it. Um, but yes, so, so this is our trick for automating. So here's the most common codon usage. Here's things that look like E. coli, abundant proteins. We get our, our modes. We draw our axis. Um, and then we've got funny things left over. Even um, so, so Aquifax aeolicus, I mean, it has almost no high expression bias, but it does have kind of a little cloud over here that's different. Um, Well, um, uh, hugely, um, the more streamlined the genome, the less we have of these unusual genes. So, you know, as, especially if you go to a pathologically reduced genome, you just don't see them. Um, I mean, you also, in those genomes, you don't tend to see high expression codon usage either. Um, the, uh, uh, and the bigger the genome gets, the more of it that tends to be in that cloud. Um, and, and yes, we can see it in your organism. I did it. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time? No, we did not do any expression related. Uh, so the question was, did we separate genes that are constitutive for non-constitutive? We did, I mean, one of my problems with anything like that, everybody asks, have you looked at it in the microarrays and stuff? And as I say, under what condition? I mean, um, there's no magic condition. I mean, we could do constitutive. We know, for, I mean, for most genomes, constitutive, you know, is primarily down here and grades up into some of the abundant protein genes. Um, so there's no real, uh, but, but what conditions really becomes a, a major issue? And um, just because a protein is, you know, highly expressed under one condition doesn't actually necessarily give it the high expression codon uh, usage. So, so how does this relate to the HNS in Salmonella? Um, I have not seen the data. Talking with Jim Slough, um, it sounds to me, and I don't know if Katie has looked at this. I mean, there, there, are, there are HNS binding assays of the entire genome, so ChIP-seq analysis. We have not compared that. All indications tend to be this is, these are the regions HNS is bound in. Um, now, one of the, the I, from my point of view, this comes with a lot of caveats. HNS is not very broadly distributed phylogenetically. We don't know in most other lineages. So does Bacillus have an HS, HNS equivalent? Uh, for those who don't know, HNS is a protein that in Salmonella, um, it tends to bind AT-rich DNA. That's a grossly, gross oversimplification. What it probably does is has specific binding sites, and then from those, it polymerase, polymerizes out over the local DNA, and it is an inhibitor of transcription, and very, a non-specific inhibitor of, tra of local transcription. Um, these DNAs are mostly, most of the time, not very highly expressed. They, when they, and, and pathogenicity islands are one of the few actually where we, we know when they're expressed. I mean, uh, a lot of these others, we have no idea when they're expressed. Was so there another part? You know, we're running 